Persistence without essence, Jessica Leach, The Philosophical Quarterly, published the 13th of July, 2024. Abstract questions of persistence and change are central to metaphysics. There is almost always a role for subtle or essential properties to play in theories of persistence. However, one might reasonably be suspicious of many of the claims about subtle properties and essential properties, on which so many accounts of persistence conditions rest. The aim of this paper is to think through what persistence looks like if we don't help ourselves to these assumptions. In so doing, we shall uncover a deep and difficult problem when it comes to identity facts and their relation to qualitative facts. Towards the end of the paper, I sketch a potential line of response that builds upon our seeming awareness of a genuinely persisting self. Criteria of identity, essentialism, identity, persistence, sort all, self. My introduction questions of persistence and change are central to metaphysics. What changes can an object survive? What changes would destroy an object? What determines the conditions for persistence and survival for different kinds of things? There is almost always a role for subtle or essential properties to play in theories of persistence, albeit in different ways. However, one might reasonably be suspicious of many of the claims about subtle properties and essential properties on which so many accounts of persistence conditions rest. The aim of this paper is to think through what persistence looks like if we don't help ourselves to these assumptions. In so doing, we shall uncover a deep and difficult problem when it comes to identity facts and their relation to qualitative facts. The plan for the paper is as follows. First, I introduce a range of views in which assumptions about subtle and essential properties play a role in persistence conditions. Next, I dismiss an initial kind of argument in favor of subtle essentialism, that our capacity to think about individual objects is connected to subtle properties. Having set aside this kind of argument, I suggest that an important underlying motivation for subtleist or essentialist views may be the avoidance of two significant problems, which I call the problem of ignorance and the problem of chaos. However, if we use these problems to formulate a certain kind of argument for subtle essentialism, or similar, we risk begging the question. I will argue that we find ourselves in a predicament. We must face the challenge that there is a prima facie a deep disconnect between identity facts and qualitative facts. Having seen the problem, it becomes clear that it is more pervasive than merely for subtle essentialism. Any attempt to justify drawing a link between identity facts and qualitative facts looks to be in trouble. This is my main conclusion. But to close I will briefly sketch a potential line of response that builds upon our seeming awareness of a genuinely persisting self. I should note that my discussion here is largely orthogonal to another, albeit related, set of issues about persistence concerning whether objects are three or four dimensional. I believe that the arguments and issues to be discussed here can be transposed into either of these frameworks. For example questions about identity over time for an enduring object correspond to questions about which temporal parts belong to the same perturing object. As such, I will for the most part not directly address these debates in the following. However, I will return to this issue in section 6, when considering potential responses to my main conclusion to persistence, sortals, and essence. What is a sortal property? Roughly speaking, a sortal property is a property that allows us to count things. For example, being a kitten and being a cat are sortal properties, since we can count kittens and we can count cats. A substance sortal property is, moreover, a sortal property that determines persistence conditions for its bearers. For example, in this way of thinking, it is plausible that cat, or perhaps mammal, is a substance sortal, whereas kitten is not. Being a cat seems to determine the kinds of changes that a thing can survive or not. For example, being fed, survive, or being turned to stone, not survive, which in turn implies that a cat cannot lose that property of being a cat. Without ceasing to exist for then the thing would have no determination of its persistence at all. However, being a kitten is not a substance sortal because something that is a kitten can survive the loss of this property. Plausibly, kittens survive growing up into big cats. This leads us to the notion of a face sortal. A sortal property that something can acquire and or lose without consequences for its continuing existence. Examples of phase sortals include being a police officer, being a kitten, being a teenager, and so on. 
sort or properties are implicated, more or less strongly, in various different views that have consequences for the persistence of things. Here are a few important examples. Aristotelian sort of essentialism, as everything one has a substance sort or property, and substance sort or properties are had necessarily, too. So, for example, Tibbles has cat as his substance sort or property, being a cat determines Tibbles's persistence conditions, and, moreover, Tibbles is necessarily a cat, and thereby has those persistence conditions necessarily. Weak Aristotelian sort of essentialism, whilst everything has a substance sort or property, and substance sort or properties are had permanently. 3. One might agree that a thing's substance sort or determines its persistence conditions, and to that extent agree that substance sort or properties are had at all times if at any times, but hold back from the further claim that substance sort or properties are had necessarily. For example, since Tibbles is a cat now, it follows that Tibbles always was and will be a cat throughout his existence. However, Tibbles might not have been a cat at all, and if he hadn't been, if he had been born a tortoise instead, then Tibbles's persistence conditions would have been those of a tortoise. As and was our views concerning the modality and temporality of sort or properties. There is a different but related debate about criteria of identity between criterialists and anti-criterialists. Criterialism. There are non-trivial, informative criteria of diachronic identity. That is to say, according to the criterialist, there are non-trivial, informative necessary and sufficient conditions for identity over time. Most simply, those criteria may be of the form, ci, ci necessarily, x that is identical to y at if and only if. However, one might worry that such a conditional purports to analyze identity, which is arguably primitive and so not apt for analysis, for all, even if one doesn't take the conditional as seriously as that, one might doubt whether there is going to be a plausible fleshing out of that would genuinely cover all cases of persistence, in which case, a criterialist may prefer something of the form, CIK, or similar, which provides different criteria of identity for different sorts of things, 5. CIK necessarily, X that is the same K as Y at if and only if, sort of essentialism both as and was, and criterialism are natural bedfellows, since substance sortals are typically taken to determine informative persistence conditions. The opponent of the criterialist is the anti-criterialist. Anti-criterialism, there are no non-trivial, informative criteria of diachronic identity. Note, however, that a denial of criterialism doesn't mean that anything goes for the anti-criterialist. For example, Merrick's 1998 rejects criterialism, but maintains that things have essential properties. More soon, one can combine as or was with tweaking, six with anti-criterialism, persistence is indexed to sortals, such that an object is, perhaps necessarily of the same sort at all moments of its existence. But sortals do not determine informative persistence conditions 3. Thinking about things, despite their disagreements, as, was, criterialism, and even, we shall see, often anti-criterialism are committed to a connection between sortals and the persistence or identity conditions for things. But why? Here is one reason. There is a line of argument, particularly well exemplified by David Wiggins, that ties our capacity to keep track of the same object in thought to its substance, sort or property. This is encapsulated by Wiggins' anchor constraint. X could have the property, or it is possible for X to have, if and only if it is genuinely possible to conceive of X's having, and the thing that genuinely conceives of X's having only if there is some sort or concept, F such that, I, F adequately answers the Aristotelian question what X is, and commits anyone who singles a thing out as an instantiation of F to an identity come. Persistence condition for X. 2. F and are cosseted fillable by X. And if X had the property that would not preclude X as being singled out as this very instantiation of F. Wiggins 2001. 121. First, possibility is tied to conceivability. Possibly X is if and only if it is conceivable that X is. We are then given an account of what it takes for it to be conceivable that X is, according to which this conceivability is tied to a sortal concept. Briefly put, X has to have a sortal property which it retains in all of the possible circumstances in which we attempt to envisage X having. 
It follows from these two claims that we cannot conceive of some individual lacking its actual substance sort or property, and having some other property instead, and therefore it is impossible for some individual to lack its actual substance sort or property. 7. However, this kind of conceivability argument comes up against much potential counter-evidence. We can easily make sense of cases and stories where things persist through change in sort or properties, or where things might have been of a different sort. Some characters in Narnia are changed from flesh to stone, and back to flesh again without loss of identity, or so the story seems to us. The horror of Kafka's metamorphosis is not Gregor's destruction at the beginning of the story, but his change of sort or property from human to insect. I'm sure the reader can come up with more of these kinds of examples. Such examples are not cut and dried, but they provide prima facie evidence that we can genuinely conceive of an individual in possible circumstances, where it lacks its actual substance sort or property. 8. In response, one could reply that these are mere modal illusions. We're not really thinking of the things we thought we were thinking of. 9. But, it is unclear how to adjudicate this kind of disagreement. On the one hand, we have our own intuitions about what we think we are conceiving of. On the other, we have the contention that we are not conceiving of what we thought we were conceiving of. At this point, it seems to me that the onus should be on the latter to show that we are not thinking of what we thought we were thinking of. And how could one show this? At worst, this Wiggins-style argument fails. At best, the debate about whether our conceivings are illusory or not gets horribly unclear and messy. I therefore think we have very good reason to set aside this kind of conceptual argument for sort of essentialism, i.v. chaos and ignorance there is an important motivation and a potential argument lurking here. This is brought out nicely by Trent and Merricks in his discussion of an objection to anti criterialism Suppose I grant, for reductio, that there are no criteria of identity over time. From this it follows that you could be identical with simply anything, Tomorrow, for instance, you could be a cat, and a cat could be you, or you could be a hat box. But this is obviously absurd, therefore there must be criteria of identity. Merrick's 1998, 118, his response is to appeal to essentialism minus criterialism. Why? Oh, you are probably worried that if criterialism were false, then tomorrow I could have all the intrinsic properties now had by a hat box and it could have the intrinsic properties now had by me, but nothing of the sort follows from a rejection of criterialism. It is consistent to maintain that criterialism is false and that persons, and cats and hat boxes, have essential properties. Among my essential properties are, I think, being a person and failing to be a cat or hat box. Merrick's 1998, 118. This brings to mind a metaphysical problem, which I shall call the problem of chaos. Problem of chaos, if identity stroke persistence facts are not tied to any qualitative facts, then it is possible for there to be complete chaos, in the sense that the relation between identity stroke persistence facts and qualitative facts may be entirely random and arbitrary. Even if there is a correlation between them, this would be pure chance. I am here taking identity stroke persistence facts to be facts about which thing is which at a time and over time, and I am taking qualitative facts to be facts about the instantiation and distribution of properties and relations over space and time. The worry is then that the possibility of complete chaos, as described by the problem of chaos, is obviously absurd. Simon Langford, 2017, provides a catalogue of these sorts of reactions. These results are absurd. Duncan, 2014, these are, to put it mildly, Highly counterintuitive consequences, Shoemaker 2012, too wild to countenance as a possibility, Zimmerman 1998, Langford 2017, 618 621, rightly responds at length that there is no solid argument here beyond a general expression of outrage. There is a related epistemological problem, which I shall call the problem of ignorance. Problem of ignorance, if identity stroke persistence facts are not tied to any qualitative facts, then identity stroke persistence facts are in principle entirely unknowable. The worry here stems from the plausible claim that our knowledge of objects, at least in many cases, is mediated by our experience or perception or knowledge of the distribution of properties. We don't see bare identity facts, 
Rather, we see instances of properties bundled together, interacting in more or less predictable ways, and so on. The problem of ignorance trades on the idea that we can't, so to speak, peer around the backsides of property instances to check which individuals are instantiating them at any given time. 10. An instance of the problem of ignorance is that we can't know what the relation is in general between identity stroke persistence facts and qualitative facts. Hence, we can't come to know whether chaos reigns or not. It would seem that without something like essentialism or criterialism we risk chaos and ignorance. These kinds of views all posit systematic relations between identity stroke persistence facts and qualitative facts. 11. But, is avoiding the problems of chaos and ignorance a sufficient reason to adopt one of these views? I answer, not if we don't have a good independent reason for holding one of those views besides. Such an argument would go, roughly, as follows. Chaos and ignorance are bad. The view rules out total chaos and ignorance. Therefore, we have one strong point in favor of endorsing the view. There may then be further points to be made about the details in order to settle on one view rather than another. For example, was rather than as. But the main thrust comes from the avoidance of chaos and ignorance. However, I fear that, once we think this through more carefully, such an argument is viciously circular. If our task is to give reasons for why we should hold one of these views about persistence and identity, then the challenge is to say why we should think that identity facts are tied to qualitative facts in one of the ways suggested. To simply claim that they are, because otherwise they would not be, is to beg the question. That is, we risk formulating a version of the following argument. If there is not a systematic connection between persistence facts and qualitative facts, then there is not a systematic connection between persistence facts and qualitative facts. For example, if sortal essentialism were false, then chaos would reign, but there is a systematic connection between persistence facts and qualitative facts. For example, chaos doesn't reign, that's absurd. Therefore, there is a systematic connection between persistence facts and qualitative facts. For example, therefore, sortal essentialism is true. It is clear to see that the overall shape of argument, in italics, begs the question. That may be obscured by particular ways to present versions of those premises, as, for example, in the square brackets. But, appearances can be deceiving, as shown here. Moreover, the first premise also risks its own form of triviality. We cannot simply appeal to the avoidance of chaos in this way to argue that chaos does not reign. But, perhaps I am being too quick here. Surely it's true that I couldn't turn into a hippopotamus tomorrow. However, if something like this can be taken for granted, we can reformulate a version of this kind of argument. 1. If there is not a systematic connection between persistence facts and qualitative facts, then I could turn into a hippopotamus tomorrow. 2. It is not the case that I could turn into a hippopotamus tomorrow. 3. Therefore, there is a systematic connection between persistence facts and qualitative facts. 12. However, this argument still threatens a problematic kind of circularity. For why, we should ask, should we agree that it is not the case that I could turn into a hippopotamus tomorrow? Isn't that precisely the kind of claim at issue here? This might indeed be our initial intuition, but if we interrogate that intuition, what does it amount to? Either we can provide further theoretical backing, or not. In the former case, that is going to have to take the form of some kind of general claim concerning qualitative constraints on persistence facts, in which case we are returned in effect to the first argument and the threat of circularity. The latter case seems inadequate. Surely we need some justification for two, if we are to find the argument at all convincing. One might suggest at this point that such claims are akin to Marian facts, not subject to reasonable doubt. However, Penelope Mackey has made a proposal concerning tenacious properties which, to my mind, explains away these kinds of intuitions about far-fetched possibilities, and with it undermines this kind of intuitive or Marian support for two. Let us call the property of an object quasi-essential, or tenacious if to suppose that the object lacks this property is to envisage a very remote possibility, one that would be ignored in all but abnormal contexts, then, I suggest... The role that is typically accorded to essential properties may be played, without significant loss, by quasi-essential tenacious properties. Mackey 2006, 155. I leave the details to Mackey here, but, the key thought is this. 
for the vast majority of purposes for which we engage in counterfactual musings. We ignore the remotest of possibilities. For example, if I'm wondering about what I could have done differently to avoid missing the train this morning, I consider only a specific range of close possible worlds in which, say, I am still human, live in the same house, have the same distance to travel to the station, but which vary over when I set my alarm. Whether or not I engage in 20 minutes doom scrolling before getting out of bed, and so on. What I don't consider are scenarios such as my turning into a hippopotamus or a hatbox, and the implications of that for my catching the train. Having already criticized many other lines of argument for essential properties throughout her book, Mackie's suggestion is therefore that, since the role typically played by purportedly necessary properties, can just as well be played by tenacious properties, we have no good reason to make the stronger claim of necessity. Mackie's argument is put in terms of essential properties understood as necessary properties, attempting to undermine mass claims such as that any hippopotamus is necessarily a hippopotamus. Premise 2 made a slightly weaker whilst claim that I could not turn into a hippopotamus. But, Mackie's point stands, for the majority of purposes, we ignore remote possibilities in which humans turn into hippopotamuses. But, this gives us no reason to reject the very existence of remote possibilities. We could use this as an argument against essentialism. But, more to the point here, I take this to undermine the thought that claims such as two are good candidates for Marian facts. Perhaps claims of tenacity are, but not necessity. It is surely a remote possibility that I turn into a hippopotamus tomorrow. And I'm certainly not taking that into account in my plans for the weekend. But... I don't have a good reason to entirely rule it out. Of course, my criticism of this line of argument based on avoiding chaos and ignorance does not rule out there being other reasons to endorse a form of essentialism or critique realism. If there were such reasons and they were convincing, then we could conclude that chaos and ignorance do not reign after all. But, given the setup of these problems, it is hard to see what else could provide support for one of these views. The problem of ignorance in effect rules out the possibility of appeal to empirical evidence for a systematic connection between persistence facts and qualitative facts. All we can observe, so goes the thought, are the qualitative facts, and so without being able also to independently detect persistence facts, we cannot verify any potential link between them. This line of thought could be supported by appeal to an argument from Shamik Dasgupta. He rejects the view that there are primitive individuals, that is, individuals at the most fundamental level of reality. I am arguing for something weaker, the possibility of chaos and ignorance. But, part of his argument supports my conclusion. He argues that primitive individuals are redundant to our best physical theories. Using the example of Newtonian gravitation theory, NGT, and are therefore empirically undetectable. First, primitive individuals are redundant to NGT, given any two closed systems governed by, and only by, the laws of NGT, if at an initial time they differ only in their individualistic facts, but are exactly the same in all other respects, including all general facts, then they will continue to be exactly the same in all those other respects at all subsequent times. Das Gute 2009, 40. Secondly, given this lack of correspondence between individualistic, identity, facts and general qualitative, facts, primitive individuals are empirically undetectable. The redundancy of primitive individuals in all our best confirmed physical theories means that if the laws of physics are anything like what we think they are, it is impossible to build a device that would allow us to distinguish between two situations differing only in primitive individuals, no matter how much funding we are granted. If this is right, then primitive individuals are empirically undetectable according to our best confirmed physics. Das Gupta 2009, 42. Das Gupta's individualistic facts include what I have been calling identity stroke persistence facts. 13. So we can use his arguments to also conclude that any identity stroke persistence facts underlying the qualitative facts available to scientific observation are empirically undetectable. We therefore cannot appeal to empirical methods to dispel the problem of ignorance, nor can we use empirical methods to verify whether or not chaos reigns. If empirical evidence is not available to us, 
Can we turn to a priori or conceptual reasons to favor an essentialist or criterialist view? I have already set aside one option here, in casting doubt on the anchor constraint. Let me consider another. We can, and often do, introduce the connection between sort or concepts and counting by example. For example, suppose I ask you to count all of the individual things in the room. You might reasonably object that this request needs to be a lot more specific. Do I count the table legs as well as the table? Do I count just the curtain, or the thread and the fabric? Do I count atoms as well as medium-sized dry goods? What about the subatomic particles? And so on. The next step then is usually to say that to make progress, we need to specify what sorts of things to count. Counting needs sortals. The potential deeper lesson may be that the relationship between counting and sortals shows that individuality and identity must always be tied to sortals, or similar, and so the problems of chaos and ignorance are misguided. The very idea of some kind of bare identity strict persistence facts, not tied to qualitative facts, is just wrong. There may be some truth in this. Sortals do indeed seem to provide us with the resources to carve up the world into countable bits. Although it's not clear to me that sorts are the only way to yield countable bits. 14 But even so, this would at most give us a minimal commitment to the idea that every countable individual has a sortal property. In other words, if there are some identity facts then there are also some qualitative sortal facts. It doesn't follow from this that there is a further tie between identity facts and qualitative facts, such as that those sortal properties are had permanently, or had necessarily, or that they are connected to informative persistence conditions. 15 In some, I don't see a good reason to be a sortal essentialist or a criterialist. We lack both empirical and conceptual reasons for holding such views. But, rejecting these views leads to the problems of chaos and ignorance, which don't seem like satisfactory stopping points. What to do? In the next section, I consider some further potential responses, which will in fact lead us to the conclusion that the disconnect between identity and qualitative facts is even deeper than already suggested. V. Weaker continuity and other beasts, how can we avoid the threats of chaos and ignorance? We have already seen that Merrick's 1998 defense against the threat of chaos incurred by anti criterialism by appeal to essence. But, of course, this is to make precisely the assumption about the relationship between identity stroke persistence facts and qualitative facts that is being challenged. So we must look elsewhere. Langford, 2017, recognizes the same problem, but he purports to defend anti-criterialism by appealing to the non-empirical virtues of hypotheses that tie persistence facts to certain qualitative facts. Take, for example, hypothesis H1 human beings existing at different times are identical if they are biologically continuous. Langford 2017, 622. A promising strategy, I suggest is for anti-criterialists to look to the non-empirical virtues of H1 as compared with its rivals. The non-empirical virtues include simplicity, elegance, conservatism, explanatory power and avoidance of inexplicable coincidences. If H1 turns out overall to have greater non-empirical virtues than its rivals, that will provide anti-criterialists with good reason to endorse it. Langford 2017, 623. One concern with this strategy is that we lack the resources to judge whether these features really are virtues, given our purported lack of epistemic access, empirical or conceptual, to the realm of identity stroke persistence facts, if there are such. These features may have proven their mettle in the empirical sciences, which deal with qualitative facts, but there is no track record to which we can appeal to suggest that identity stroke persistence facts can be expected to behave in this way. Indeed, one might think that the theoretically virtuous thing to do at this point would be to deny the existence of individuals and identity stroke persistence facts about them. This is indeed the move that does good to makes. He argues that we shouldn't believe in the existence of things which are redundant and empirically undetectable. Since primitive individuals play no explanatory role in our understanding of reality, it would be a poor theory that posited their existence even so. In Dasgupta's terms, they are danglers, and, he argues, we shouldn't believe in the existence of danglers. So, if anything, Langford's emphasis on theoretical virtues may in fact lead us to outright reject the existence of individuals, 
rather than to accept hypotheses about the identity and persistence of such things. Langford's argument may prove too much for his purposes. We could try to defend essentialism in order to avoid the problems of chaos and ignorance. But, perhaps we don't need anything so strong. The problem of chaos casts doubt on there being any systematic connection between identity strict persistence facts and qualitative facts, so any such connection would avoid chaos, and it need not be as strong as tying identity strict persistence to sort or continuity. We might instead consider the idea that persistence involves spatio-temporal continuity, or causal chains of a certain kind, or something similarly modest, at a minimum. We might allow that if two things are in different places at the same time, then they are distinct. Surely that does something to alleviate the threats of chaos and ignorance. Even though such minimal conditions on persistence seem more plausible than full-blown sort of essentialism, indeed, the idea that one thing can't be in two different places at the same time is a pretty basic thought. I think we can run the same kinds of arguments to reach the same kinds of alarming conclusions. On the one hand, for all we've seen, it is unclear what empirical evidence could support such accounts. If various proposals concerning continuity involve qualitative facts, such as spatial, temporal, and or causal properties and relations, then it is just as much the case that we have no empirical access to any identity facts underlying them. The structure of the proposal and the problem are just the same, and then on the other hand, we can undermine any conceptual type arguments, along the lines of a weakened anchor constraint, by conceiving of counterexamples that make sense to us. For example, perhaps the fact that we can make sense of debates about time travel, and the scenarios discussed therein, as well as time travel in fiction, suggests that spatio-temporal continuity is not a necessary condition of keeping track of an individual in thought. So overall, the weaker view is no more helpful, we still have no reason to believe that chaos cannot reign. One might object here that spatio-temporal location and continuity are not purely qualitative. There is a rich tradition, encompassing figures as diverse as Kant and Armstrong, that takes space and time to be importantly particularizing. 16 facts about spatio-temporal locations and relations, on such a view, do not count as purely qualitative, but in fact provide the basis for identity and difference among things, in which case, surely appeal to spatio-temporal constraints on persistence and identity, will not be vulnerable to the same kinds of objections as subtle, or similarly qualitative, constraints, no. Even if we grant that space and time are particularizing, this need only be in a generic sense. Spatio-temporal locations may be sufficient to determine a number of distinct entities, for example that things in different places at the same time are two rather than one. But, this is not yet to specify which thing is which, that is, to provide identity stroke persistence facts. Consider the kinds of scenarios at work in so-called switching arguments, that is, Arguments concerning whether one could have two qualitatively identical worlds differing only in identity facts. 17. What is not at issue in these arguments is any concern over the number of entities at each world. For example, take worlds W1 and W2. Containing only Plato and Socrates W1, Plato is F1, Fn W2, Socrates is F1, Fn Socrates is G1, Gn Plato is G1, Gn, we might disagree over whether W1 and W2 are two genuinely distinct possibilities, but it is taken for granted that each putative possible world contains two entities. Similarly, we might agree that spatio-temporal locations and relations particularize the world, so as to determine, at least to some extent, how many particulars there are, but, it remains to be seen whether there are any further facts about which is which, and whether those identity facts should be tied to spatio-temporal location and continuity or not. Indeed, what do we have to go on when considering the relation between spatio-temporal locations and relations and identity stroke persistence facts? Well, again, the only other facts that we have access to are qualitative, for example that such and such properties are located at such and such spatio-temporal locations, and so on. So again, just because we know where and when qualitative properties are. It's not clear how this helps us to draw a principled link between the identity and persistence of things and spatio-temporal facts 6. What now? In this paper, thus far, 
I have argued that a rejection of some kind of sortalism or essentialism in connection to identity and persistence leads to the problems of chaos and ignorance. I have also tried to show that these problems are deep and stubborn. We cannot use the avoidance of the problems of chaos and ignorance as an argument for sort of essentialism or similar views. Without begging the question, conceptual responses to the problems, such as conceivability-based arguments for sort of essentialism, are at best inconclusive, but also empirical evidence for sort of essentialism or similar is blocked by the problem of ignorance. I have also considered some other potential responses to the problems and found them to be unsatisfactory. My main aim in this paper is to reach this point, to argue that the problems of chaos and ignorance are compelling and extremely difficult to escape. But what now? Do we embrace chaos and ignorance? Isn't doing so absurd, highly counterintuitive, and too wild to countenance? Whilst these responses alone do not constitute an argument against the problems, nor a solution to them, they do highlight the need for an account of how to cope with chaos and ignorance, given how counterintuitive they appear to be. There are two broad options here. One, accept the conclusion and find a way to live with it. Two, revisit the argument and find a way to reject the conclusion. There are many ways we might follow these options. For example, one way to take option one would be to accept the existence of a knowable identity stroke persistence facts accepting a thoroughgoing skepticism. Another way would be to reject the existence of identity stroke persistence facts altogether. One might understand some versions of stage theory as providing an example of the latter view, 18 in brief. Whereas endurantists take material things such as wombats to be three-dimensional, existing wholly at different times, and perdurantists take material things such as wombats to be four-dimensional, extended through time with temporal parts, Stage theorists, or exterantists, take material things such as wombats to be momentary stages that do not persist, 19 according to the exterantist, so-called persisting objects are in fact series of stages connected by some relation, 20 when, it comes to the arguments above, I suggested earlier that they could be transposed into the register of any of these views, for endurantists, we can ask under what conditions three-dimensional objects at different times are identical. Must they, for example, be of the same sort? For perdurantists, we can ask under what conditions temporal parts are constituents of the same four-dimensional object. However, for the exturantist, one might think that we have a way to evade the question. There are just momentary stages, with various relations holding between them, providing us with the resources to give an account of why we experience or speak a series of these stages, as if they were whole objects that maintain their identity over time in one way or another. I think the stage theory response is worthy of exploration, however, I am skeptical whether it will hold up under scrutiny. For example, the view still makes assumptions about the identity of individual stages, in particular, no identity over time. Moreover, if we take seriously Dusgupta's argument for the rejection of primitive individuals, one might think this applies just as much to stage-sized individuals as to temporarily thicker ones as well. This leads us on to another way to take option. One, we could follow Dasgupta, reject individuals and reformulate the language in which we do metaphysics. As mentioned earlier, Dasgupta argues that we should reject primitive individuals because our best physical theories imply that they are physically redundant and empirically undetectable. Dasgupta 2009 37. He recommends, instead, that we adopt generalism, the view that all fundamental facts are general. More precisely, the generalist claims that the fundamental facts of the world are those expressed by a language, which is entirely general in contrast to the language of predicate logic. Das Gupta accordingly develops a generalist language, effectively a dialect of functories. 21. This response isn't so much to embrace chaos and ignorance, as to reject the idea that there is any realm out there at all to be chaotic and unknown. In so doing the problems are dispelled. I have nothing in particular against this strategy, perhaps generalism is true, but the assumption of the existence of individuals seems so basic to our everyday thinking and experience of the world, that it is perhaps worthwhile pausing again to see if there is any alternative way forward. To follow option two, then, we'd need to find a way to resist the arguments for chaos and ignorance. 
In the next and final section, I will briefly sketch one potential line of thought 7, identity in the self for the most part, I can get my head around the kind of picture that emerges from the foregoing arguments. There are property instances across space and time, with variously predictable patterns, that correspond, and perhaps give rise to, our everyday thinking about objects and persistence in terms of sortals or similar, but these do not necessarily correspond to any identity or persistence facts. For example, a predictable pattern of wombat instances moves around the sanctuary, interacts in variously predictable ways with water, food, burrows, and keepers. But the idea that the same primitive individual instantiates all of the wombat kind instances is set to one side either rejected or otherwise ignored as epistemically inaccessible, and so on. But one sticking point in this way of thinking seems to be how we think of or experience ourselves. My sense of my own continuing identity over time what even allows me to make sense of carrying through the train of thought in this sentence, seems to constitute some kind of clear, direct, obvious awareness of a fact of identity over time. If this is right, then we have one count against the possibility of total chaos, and one count against total ignorance of persistence facts. In other words, one line of response to the argument in this paper would be to provide a plausible example of genuine knowledge or experience of identity facts unmediated by qualitative facts, and to build from there. Perhaps we have such knowledge or experience in cases of self-knowledge or self-awareness. However, Hume famously cast doubt on the idea that we have anything like the direct experience of a self that would be required. For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception, and never can observe anything but the perception when my perceptions are removed for any time. As by sound sleep, so long am I insensible of myself, and may truly be said not to exist. Q1985, I, IV, 6, 300, and not just Hume. For example, some Buddhist views of the self would deny the existence of any individual thing that we experience. Rather, there is a stream of psychophysical states, some of which give rise to the illusion of the self. 22 Hume's concern here is well taken, but there are potential responses. Consider Chisholm's observation that Hume's very mode of expressing his argument seems to make reference to and presuppose a persisting subject. It looks very much as though the self that Hume professed to be unable to find is the one that he finds to be stumbling, to be stumbling onto different perceptions. How can he say that he doesn't find himself, if he is correct in saying that he finds himself to be stumbling on, more fully, that he finds himself to be stumbling on certain things, and not to be stumbling on certain other things? Chisholm 1969, 10. This is a tempting line of thought, but... It doesn't quite rule out the possibility of illusion. It leaves open the possibility of an aggregate of particular individual states, each of which seems to itself as if it is a subject experiencing a stumbling onto this or that perception, each of which may even build in a sense of recollection or anticipation of other states, perhaps prior stumbling seemings. We need to be able to give an account of what makes these experiences of a persisting self, if indeed they are. Chisholm's observation here needs more theoretical underpinning. Chisholm attempts to offer this. In the same paper, he develops an adverbial theory of perception according to which a subject's perceiving X, for example S as seeing a red patch, should not be understood as a relation between two things, S and X, but rather as a mode of S. S sees redly. Chisholm takes it to follow from this that, if a subject is aware of having an experience, then they must also be aware of themselves. For in being aware of ourselves as experiencing, we are, ipso facto, aware of the self or person, of the self or person as being affected in a certain way. Chisholm 1969, 18. For Chisholm, then, if Hume is aware of his perception of heat, he must thereby be aware of himself, since his perception of heat just is Hume perceiving hotly. Nevertheless, this line of thought, at first glance, would not seem to answer the worry, for even if any experience or perception has a subject to that experience or perception, 
it does not follow that we can be aware of identity of the subject of experience across distinct experiences and perceptions. In other words, perhaps there is an awareness of the subject of Hume perceiving hotly, and an awareness of the subject of David perceiving coldly, but so far there is nothing to tell either subject that they are the same as the other, that is, an awareness that Hume is David, or vice versa. Let's think again, so far, I have tried to follow up the suggestion that we seem to have experiences of a persisting self, as a potential response to the problems of ignorance and chaos. However, Hume casts serious doubt on this. Alternatively, we might take this seeming experience of a persisting self, instead to be an important motivating factor in trying to find an alternative to generalism, or to other versions of option, one above. Just this seeming experience isn't enough to reject ignorance and chaos, but it is a motivation to try to find a better response, and provides a hint for where we might look. Consider, then, another respondent to Hume, namely Kant. Chisholm tries to argue that we get awareness of the self in experience, albeit on the side. 23 Kant does something subtly but crucially different. He doesn't argue that a genuinely persisting self, or subject of experience, itself appears in experience, but rather that various aspects of thought and experience presuppose the existence of a persisting self or subject. In a nutshell, Kant agrees with Hume that in inner experience we encounter only particular states, and not a unified, persisting self although we construct an empirical self from those constituent states. But he argues further that in order to make sense of our capacity for empirical knowledge, we must posit a self that we cannot experience, but which plays a crucial explanatory role. More carefully, there are two posits here. One is the idea of the nominal self, the self as it is in itself, which underwrites the appearance of the empirical self in inner experience. Kant also argues that we need to acknowledge a transcendental unity of our perception, something like a pure locus of thought and experience, not thought of as an object, to make sense of knowledge and experience. What makes the difference here is that, if Kant's strategy is successful, we yield an argument for a subject that has to persist over time, that is shared by more than one state, for it to do its work. 24 for example, in recent work, I developed the Kantian argument, that a capacity for thinking requires a capacity for inference, which are in turn both connected to a subject or locus of thought, that remains the same across the different steps of an inference. Leach 2023, ch. 3. It is not that in any thought we experience a persisting subject of thought. It is that our very capacity for thought is only possible if there is a persisting subject of thought which has that capacity. Insofar as we are able to become aware of that persisting subject, that will primarily be through carrying out inferences over time, rather than through something like introspection of our sense of self. This is not the place for an extended exploration of this Kantian strategy, so I will close with a few final remarks. First, note that it is harder to mount an illusion objection against the Kantian argument, which starts simply from a capacity for thought. We might be under a thoroughgoing illusion when it comes to introspective experience of the self. It is harder to entertain the possibility that all thought is illusory, in the sense that there is never thinking going on even when it appears to some subject that they are thinking, that there is thinking going on. Secondly, in the context of the overall argument of this paper, if there is a route to knowledge of the persistence of the self, we might ask whether this could be exploited to build some connections between identity stroke persistence facts and qualitative facts, further undermining the problems of ignorance and chaos. Suppose we have some epistemic access to identity and persistence of the self, unmediated by although normally accompanied by qualitative facts, if those accompanying qualitative facts exhibit a certain amount of regularity, as they often do, then this may provide evidence for how to tie at least some qualitative facts systematically to some identity stroke persistence facts, for example, regularities in the way that psychological experiences, perceptions of a body, and movements around the environment might be found to correspond to our awareness of a persisting subject. Thirdly, if it is the case that, through the self, we have some direct epistemic access to identity stroke persistence facts, if that can be appropriately associated with various qualitative regularities, and if there is a case to be made that the self is sufficiently similar to other things in the world, 
then we might be able to extrapolate from this to the likelihood of certain regularities in qualitative facts, acting as good evidence for identity strict persistence facts concerning things other than ourselves. However, these are considerably challenging ifs, not least, the Kantian idea of a persisting subject would seem to be a quite different kind of thing to the things that we think of as persisting in the world, such as wombats or mobile phones. A Kantian subject may be too dissimilar to any everyday purportedly persisting object for us to be able to draw any fruitful comparison. Nevertheless, even one case of genuine knowledge of persistence, of a persisting subject, would at least provide a response to total chaos and ignorance, and potentially a counterexample to generalism. And anyway, we need not follow Kant to the letter. It would be an interesting project to see to what extent his, or any other, Arguments for a genuinely persisting self could be developed as a response to chaos and ignorance. 25. Copyright the author, S. 2024. Published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the Scots Philosophical Association and the University of St Andrews. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses, slash by, slash four, dot zero, slash, which permits unrestricted reuse, distribution, and reproduction in any medium, provided the original work is properly cited. Jessica Leach, Persistence Without Essence, The Philosophical Quarterly, 2024, key 085, https colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash one zero, dot one zero nine three slash pq slash pk zero eight five